Welcome to today's video podcast where we embark on a journey into the short story The Vampire by Czech writer Jan Neruda. Now don't let the title mislead you. There are no blood-sucking undead creatures here. However, if you're a fan of that genre, you'll appreciate this story's morbid twist. First, I'll read the story all the way through. Next, I'll summarize the story and finally I'll reread the story while giving commentary and pointing out useful vocabulary to help you on your English learning journey. Our story begins. The steamboat had brought us from Constantinople to the shore of the island Principo, and we disembarked. There were not many in the party. A Polish family, father, mother, daughter, and the daughter's husband, then us two. And I must not forget to mention that we had been joined on the wooden bridge leading across the Golden Horn in Constantinople by a Greek, quite a young man, a painter perhaps, to judge by the portfolio which he carried under his arm. Long black hair flowed over his shoulders. His face was pale, his dark eyes deeply sunken in their sockets. At first he interested me, especially because of his readiness to chat and his familiarity with local affairs. But he had a good deal too much to say, and I soon turned away from him. I found the Polish family more pleasant. The father and mother were kind folk, the husband an elegant young man of unassuming and polished manners. They were traveling to Principo to spend the summer months there for the sake of their daughter, who was slightly ailing. Judging from the beautiful girl's paleness, it appeared either that she was just recovering from a severe illness or that she was about to be attacked by one. She leaned upon her husband, showed a fondness for sitting down, and a frequent dry cough interrupted her whispering. Whenever she coughed, her husband stood still in concern. He kept looking at her pityingly, and she at him, as much as to say, There is really nothing the matter. How happy I am! They were clearly convinced of recovery and happiness. On the recommendation of the Greek, who had left us immediately after docking, the family had rented a lodging at the inn which stands on the hill. The innkeeper was a Frenchman, and his whole house, in accordance with French style, was arranged comfortably and neatly. We had lunch together, and when the heat of noon had abated a little, we all made our way up the hill to a pine grove where we could refresh ourselves with the view. Soon after we discovered a suitable spot and had settled down, the Greek once more made his appearance. He greeted us in a casual way, looking around him, and sat down only a few paces from us. He opened his portfolio and began to draw. I believe he has purposely sat close against the rock, so that we can't look at his drawing, I said. We need not look, observed the young Pole. We can see quite enough in front of us. And after a while he added, It seems to me that he is including us in the foreground of his drawing. Let him. Truly there was enough for us to see. There is no lovelier nook in the world than this Principo. The martyr Irene of Athens spent a month there in banishment. If I could pass a single month of my life there, the memory of it would make me happy for all the remainder of my days. Even that single day I spent there I shall never forget. The air was as clear as diamond, so soft, so delightful, that it wrapped all of one's soul. On the right, beyond the sea, towered the brown summits of Asia. On the left, the steep shore of Europe faded into the bluish distance. Close by, Haiki, one of the nine islands that form the archipelago of the Prince, rose up with its cypress woods into the silent height like a mournful dream crowned with a large building, this, a refuge to refresh the spirit. The waters of the Sea of Marmara were only slightly ruffled and played in all colors like a sparkling opal. In the distance was the ocean, white as milk, then rose-tinted, then between two islands like a glowing orange, and beneath us of a beautiful greenish blue, like a transparent sapphire. It was alone in its beauty. No large vessels were to be seen. Only two small craft with English flags were slipping along by the shore. One was a steamboat, the size of a watchman's booth. The other was manned by about twelve rowers, and when all their oars were lifted at the same time, it was as if molten silver were trickling from them. Dolphins were moving in their mists and flew in long curves above the surface of the water. From time to time, across the blue sky, peaceful eagles soared, measuring out a boundary between two portions of the world. 
The whole slope beneath us was hidden by blossoming roses, with whose fragrance the air was saturated. From the cafe near the sea, music, muffled by the distance, vibrated through the air. The impression was overwhelming. We all grew silent and savored the paradise. The young Polish lady was lying with her head resting in her husband's lap. The pale oval of her delicate face gained a slight color, and tears suddenly began to flow from her blue eyes. Her husband understood. He bent forward and kissed tear upon tear. Her mother also began to shed tears, and I myself was strangely moved. Mind and body must be healed here, whispered the girl. What a happy place. God knows I have no enemies, but if I had, here I would forgive them, declared the father with a trembling voice. And again all were silent. A feeling of beauty, of inexpressible sweetness came upon all. Each one felt within him a whole world of happiness, and each one would have shared his happiness with the whole world. Each one felt the same, and so no one disturbed the other. We did not even notice that the Greek, after an hour or so, had arisen, closed his portfolio, and after greeting us again, had gently departed. We remained. Finally, after some hours, when the distance was hiding itself in a dusky violet hue, which in the south is so magically lovely, the mother urged us to make our way back. We arose and strolled down to the inn, our steps as free and elastic as those of children without a care in the world. Soon after we had sat down, we heard quarreling under the veranda. The Greek was quarreling there with the innkeeper, and we listened for our amusement. The quarrel didn't last long. If I had no other guests here, growled the innkeeper, and came up the steps toward us. Would you kindly tell me, sir, asked the young Pole of the innkeeper as he came along, who this gentleman is and what his name is. Oh, who knows what the fellow's name is, growled the innkeeper, giving a vicious glance downwards. We call him the vampire. A painter? A fine trade. He only paints corpses. If anyone in Constantinople or around here dies, he always has a portrait of the corpse ready on the same day. The fellow paints in advance and never makes a mistake. The vulture. The old Polish lady gave a cry of horror. In her arms lay her daughter, swooning, white as a sheet. And at the same instant, the husband leaped down the small flight of steps, seized the Greek by the throat with one hand, and with the other clutched at the portfolio. We quickly ran down after him. The two men were already scuffling in the sand. The portfolio was flung down, and on one sheet, sketched in pencil, was the head of the young Polish girl. Her eyes closed, a sprig of myrtle around her brow. In this story, a group of people travel by steamboat from Constantinople, now Istanbul, to the island of Prinkipo to the south. The group includes a Polish family, a mother, father, daughter, and their daughter's husband. The group also includes a Greek painter and the narrator, who I assume is a man, and his companion. The Greek painter initially intrigues the narrator because he has a lot of local knowledge, but he becomes too talkative. The focus then shifts to the Polish family, which the narrator finds pleasant. In the family, the daughter, a young woman, appears seriously unwell. Upon docking, the Greek recommends that the family rents lodging at an inn on the hill run by a Frenchman and the Greek goes his separate way. The group, comprised of the Polish family, the narrator, and his companion, enjoy lunch and later walk up a hill to enjoy its beautiful view, which the narrator describes at length. The Greek reappears to sketch. No one can see what the Greek is sketching, but the daughter's husband noticed that from where the Greek is sitting, the group would be in the foreground of the sketch. No one in the group is bothered at all by this. They are too busy enjoying the breathtaking scenery. The young Polish woman becomes emotional, expressing gratitude for the healing atmosphere atop this hill. The Greek leaves first, and the group overhears part of a quarrel between the Greek and the innkeeper. The mood changes when the innkeeper reveals that the Greek painter is known as the vampire for painting portraits of people who later die the very same day. This revelation shocks and horrifies the Polish family, leading to a confrontation between the young husband and the Greek. After a brief scuffle, the portfolio is flung open, revealing a sketch of the young Polish woman, with closed eyes and a sprig of myrtle, suggesting that he had a premonition of her impending death. 
Now I'll reread the story while pointing out useful vocabulary and summarizing as we go along. The steamboat had brought us from Constantinople to the shore of the island Prinkipo, and we disembarked. There were not many in the party. A Polish family, father, mother, daughter, and the daughter's husband. Then us two. And I must not forget to mention that we had been joined on the wooden bridge leading across the Golden Horn in Constantinople by a Greek. Quite a young man, a painter perhaps, to judge by the portfolio which he carried under his arm. Long black hair flowed over his shoulders. His face was pale, his dark eyes deeply sunken in their sockets. At first he interested me, especially because of his readiness to chat and his familiarity with global affairs. But he had a good deal too much to say, and I soon turned away from him. At the start of our story, the narrator, along with a small group, arrives on the island of Prinkipo after a steamboat journey from Constantinople. The group includes a Polish family, father, mother, daughter, and son-in-law, and the narrator with his companion. They are joined by a Greek man, who the narrator believes is a painter because the Greek is carrying a portfolio. The Greek's appearance and chattiness initially interests the narrator, but his excessive talking becomes too much for the narrator. Our more challenging words in this section include disembark, which means to leave a ship or boat, portfolio, which is a large flat case used for carrying papers or drawings, readiness, which means a willingness or eagerness to do something, and familiarity, which means knowledge or experience with something. Continuing, I found the Polish family more pleasant. The father and mother were kind folk. The husband, an elegant young man of unassuming and polished manners. They were traveling to Prinkipo to spend the summer months there, for the sake of their daughter, who was slightly ailing. Judging from the beautiful girl's paleness, it appeared either that she was just recovering from a severe illness, or that she was just about to be attacked by one. She leaned upon her husband, showed a fondness for sitting down, and a frequent, dry cough interrupted her whispering. Whenever she coughed, her husband stood still in concern. He kept looking at her pityingly, and she at him, as much as to say, there is really nothing the matter, how happy I am. They were clearly convinced of recovery and happiness. In this section, the narrator finds the Polish family more enjoyable than the Greek. The family consists of a kind father, a mother, a lovely daughter, who appears sick, and their son-in-law. They are heading to Prinkipo for the summer to support their ailing daughter. The daughter's paleness suggests either recovery from a severe illness or the possibility of impending illness. She relies on her husband for support, often sits down, and experiences a frequent dry cough. Despite her health challenges, the daughter seems happy and reassured indicating a strong belief in her recovery and overall well-being. Some useful words here include unassuming, which describes someone who is modest or not drawing attention to oneself, the word ailing, which is experiencing a decline in health or slightly unwell, and pityingly, which means in a way that shows sadness or sympathy for someone else's unhappiness or difficult situation. Our story continues. On the recommendation of the Greek, who had left us immediately after docking, the family had rented a lodging at the inn, which stands on the hill. The innkeeper was a Frenchman, and his whole house, in accordance with French style, was arranged comfortably and neatly. The Greek recommends accommodations, or a place to stay for the Polish family, and goes his own way. The recommendation is an inn at the top of a hill run by a French innkeeper. Useful words here include recommendation, which is a suggestion or advice given to someone. The word docking is the act of a ship or boat arriving and mooring at a dock. And lodging is your accommodations or place to stay. Continuing, we had lunch together, and when the heat of noon had abated a little, we all made our way up the hill to a pine grove where we could refresh ourselves with the view. Soon after we discovered a suitable spot and had settled down, the Greek once more made his appearance. He greeted us in a casual way, looking around him and sat down only a few paces from us. He opened his portfolio and began to draw. I believe he has purposely sat close to the rock so that we can't look at his drawing, I said. We need not look, observed the young Pole. We can see quite enough in front of us. And after a while, he added, it seems to me that he is including us in the foreground of his drawing. Let him. Here, after having lunch together, 
the group decides to climb the hill to a pine grove to enjoy the scenic view. Once they find a good spot, the Greek painter reappears and greets them. He sits down nearby, opens his portfolio, and begins to draw. The narrator suggests that the Greek intentionally sat in a way to prevent them from seeing his drawing. However, the young Pole dismisses the need to look, believing that the scenery is captivating enough. He even speculates that the Greek might be including them in the foreground of his artwork, and expresses a willingness to let him do so. Some useful vocabulary items here include the verb abate, which in this case means to reduce or lessen in intensity. The sun's heat abated, so the weather became cooler. A pine grove is a wooded area with pine trees. And the word foreground describes the part of a scene or image that appears closest to the viewer. The opposite of a foreground is the background. Our story continues. Truly there was enough for us to see. There is no lovelier nook in the world than this principo. The martyr, Irene of Athens, spent a month there in banishment. If I could pass a single month of my life there, the memory of it would make me happy for all the remainder of my days. Even that single day I spent there, I shall never forget. The air was as clear as diamond, so soft, so delightful, that it wrapped all of one's soul. On the right, beyond the sea, towered the brown summits of Asia. On the left, the steep shore of Europe faded into the bluish distance. Close by, Helki, one of the nine islands that formed the archipelago of the prince, rose up with its cypress woods into the silent height like a mournful dream, crowned with a large building. This, a refuge to refresh the spirit. The waters of the Sea of Mamara were only slightly ruffled, and played in all colors like a sparkling opal. In the distance was the ocean, white as milk, then rose-tinted, then between two islands like a glowing orange. And beneath us, of a beautiful greenish blue, like a transparent sapphire. It was alone in its beauty. No large vessels were to be seen. Only two small craft with English flags were slipping along by the shore. One was a steamboat, the size of a watchman's booth. The other was manned by about 12 rowers. When all their oars were lifted at the same time, it was as though molten silver were trickling from them. Dolphins were moving in their mists and flew in long curves above the surface of the water. From time to time, across the blue sky, peaceful eagles soared, measuring out a boundary between two portions of the world. In this section, the narrator describes at length the enchanting beauty of this island and expresses a deep appreciation for the landscape and that a single month on this island would bring eternal happiness. From where they are, they can see Asia on the right and Europe to the left. Our useful vocabulary words include banishment, which is the formal expulsion or removal of an individual or group from a place or community, often as a punishment or preventative measure. The narrator talks about Irene of Athens being banished on this island following a power struggle and thinks that a banishment on such a lovely island wouldn't be so bad. We have the word archipelago, which is an extensive group of islands or an island chain. Summits, which are the highest points or peaks of mountains, the narrator can see the summits of Asia from where he stands. Cypress woods are forested areas with cypress trees. To be mournful is to express sadness or a sense of loss. And a boundary is a dividing line or limit between two areas. The narrator and the group are on the boundary of two areas of the world, Asia and Europe. The whole slope beneath us was hidden by blossoming roses, with whose fragrance the air was saturated. From the cafe near the sea, Music, muffled by the distance, vibrated through the air. The impression was overwhelming. We all grew silent and savored the paradise. The young Polish lady was lying with her head resting on her husband's lap. The pale oval of her delicate face gained a slight color and tears suddenly began to flow from her blue eyes. Her husband understood. He bent forward and kissed tear upon tear. Her mother also began to shed tears, and I myself was strangely moved. Mind and body must be healed here, whispered the girl. What a happy place. God knows I have no enemies, but if I had, here I would forgive them, declared the father with a trembling voice. In this section, the scenery is overwhelming, prompting the group to fall silent and immerse themselves in the paradise surrounding them. The young Polish lady, lying with her head in her husband's lap, experiences a touching moment. Her pale face gains a slight color and tears well up in her eyes. Her husband, understanding her emotions, kisses away her tears. 
The emotional scene extends to the mother, also shedding tears. And even the narrator is emotionally moved. The young lady expresses a belief that both mind and body can find healing in this happy place. The father, emotionally stirred, declares a willingness to forgive even hypothetical enemies in such a tranquil setting. Some useful vocabulary items here include saturated, which means soaked or filled to the maximum capacity. The air was saturated with the delightful smell from the roses. Muffled can be used to describe sounds being subdued or softened. In this case, the music from the cafe is muffled by the distance. To be overwhelming means to be intensely powerful or emotionally impactful. And finally, the father speaks with a trembling voice, which is a voice that shakes or quivers due to strong emotions. Our story continues. And again, all were silent. A feeling of beauty, of inexpressible sweetness came upon all. Each one felt within him a whole world of happiness, and each one would have shared his happiness with the whole world. Each one felt the same, and so none disturbed the other. We did not even notice that the Greek, after an hour or so, had arisen, closed his portfolio, and after greeting us again, had gently departed. We remained. Finally, after some hours, when the distance was hiding itself in a dusky violet hue, which in the South is so magically lovely, the mother urged us to make our way back. We arose and strolled down to the inn, our steps as free and elastic as those of children, without a care in the world. In this section, following a moment of silence, a profound feeling of beauty and indescribable sweetness envelops everyone. Each person senses a world of happiness within themselves and wishes to share it with the entire world. This shared sentiment creates a harmonious atmosphere where no one disrupts the peace of others. The Greek painter leaves quietly after closing his portfolio, but they remain in their peaceful state. After several hours, the mother suggests returning. The group, now filled with a carefree and joyful spirit, arises and leisurely walks back to the inn. A useful vocabulary word here is inexpressible, which means unable to be described or conveyed adequately. The beauty they all experienced and the feelings they all have right now are inexpressible. Our story continues. Soon after we had sat down, we heard quarreling under the veranda. The Greek was quarreling with the innkeeper, and we listened for our amusement. The quarrel did not last long. If I had no other guests here, growled the innkeeper, and came up the steps toward us. Would you kindly tell me, sir, asked the young Pole of the innkeeper as he came along, who this gentleman is and what his name is. Oh, who knows what the fellow's name is, growled the innkeeper, giving a vicious glance downward. We call him the vampire. A painter? A fine trade. He only paints corpses. If anyone in Constantinople or round about here dies, he always has a portrait of the corpse ready on the same day. The fellow paints in advance, and he never makes a mistake. The vulture. The old Polish lady gave a cry of horror. In her arms lay her daughter, swooning, white as a sheet. And at the same instant the husband, leaped down the small flight of steps, seized the Greek by the throat with one hand, and with the other clutched at the portfolio. We quickly ran down after him. The two men were already scuffling in the sand. The portfolio was flung down, and on one sheet, sketched in pencil, was the head of the young Polish girl. Her eyes closed, a sprig of myrtle around her brow. In the end, the group hears quarreling between the Greek painter and the innkeeper. They eavesdrop for amusement. The quarrel is brief and the innkeeper, annoyed, approaches the group. The young Pole, curious about the Greek, asks the innkeeper about him. The innkeeper reveals the Greek is known as the vampire because he paints portraits of corpses, accurately predicting deaths. This revelation shocks the Polish family. The young Polish lady's mother reacts with horror as her daughter faints in her arms. Simultaneously, the husband confronts the Greek, grabbing him by the throat and attempting to seize his portfolio. The group rushes down to witness a scuffle between the two men in the sand. The portfolio is thrown down, revealing a sketch of the young Polish girl with closed eyes and a myrtle sprig round her brow. Useful words in our final section include veranda, which is a roofed platform along the outside of a house, to quarrel, which means to engage in a heated argument or dispute, to swoon, which means to faint or lose consciousness. The daughter swoons and turns white as a ghost because the Greek sketched her picture and she is the one that will die today.
To scuffle means to engage in a brief, chaotic fight. The son-in-law and the Greek are scuffling. And a sprig, which is a small branch or shoot with leaves or flowers. The type of flowers here are myrtle flowers, which in some cultures is a symbol for the love between the deceased and those mourning their loss. The narrator doesn't say explicitly if the daughter dies, but we can assume she does because according to the French innkeeper, the Greek only paints corpses. He always has a portrait of the corpse ready on the same day, and he never makes a mistake. Do you think the Greek was just a regular person who had a gift of being able to predict deaths? Or was he the Grim Reaper himself in human form? Let me know your thoughts about today's story in the comments. See you in the future!